It seems that uh, much of our modern culture, though, is an attempt to cope with this fundamental anxiety by uh, diversions in uh, yeah. what, what you've called banal pleasures. Yeah, well, you just put your finger on the most significant aspect of modern society. And we try to avoid anxiety by getting rich, by making uh, $100,000 when we're 21 years of age, by becoming millionaires. Now, none of those things uh, lead to the joy, the creativity that I'm talking about. Uh, one can own the world uh, and still be without the inner sense of, of pleasure, of joy, of courage, of creation. Uh, and I think our society is in the midst of a vast change. The society that began at the Renaissance uh, now is ending. Uh, and we are seeing the results of this ending of a social period uh, in the fact that psychotherapy has grown uh, with such uh, great zest. Almost every other person in California is a psychotherapist. It seems that way. Yes, it does. And this always happens when an age is dying. You see, the Greeks began their great uh, age in the 7th, 6th centuries B.C. Uh, and then they talked of beauty and goodness and truth, all these great things that the philosophers talked about. Yes. Uh, but uh, by the 3rd century, 2nd uh, century B.C., 1st century B.C., that had all been forgotten. The philosophers now talked about security. And they uh, tried to help people uh, get along with as little pain as possible. And they made uh, mottos for human beings. Beauty and truth and goodness had been lost. Now our Renaissance began the modern age. Uh, and at the beginning of an age, there are no psychotherapists. This is taken care of by religion and by art uh, and by beauty, by music. But at the end of an age, every age down through history, has been the same. Uh, every uh, other person becomes a therapist because there are no, uh, no ways of ministering to people in need. Uh, and they uh, form long lines to the psychotherapist's office. I think it's a sign of the decadence of our age rather than the sign of our uh, great intelligence. I know in your book, Love and Will, you refer to the uh, great poem by T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland, and, yes. and the way so many people, when it was first written at the early part of this century, seemed to relate to it, uh, not understanding its prophetic nature, Truly. that it, it, it seemed to characterize the, the emptiness of modern society. Yes. Thus, the king in the wasteland, remember, was impotent. Well, hello, my friends. Nice to see you. Happy New Year. Of course, 2023 is just a number, but, uh, you know, it's that time of year when we reflect on the past year and what we're going to do this year and make our resolutions and uh, decide how much money we're going to make and what skills we're going to learn and how much healthier we're going to be and places we're going to go and visit and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a nice time of year, and in a few weeks, it'll just be another year. And I doubt things are going to change that much this year from last year. But we'll see. Uh, there were some shockers in 2022, as you know, the war in Ukraine, of course, the ongoing nonsense surrounding COVID and whatnot. It, it doesn't matter what side you're on there. It's kind of crazy that we still haven't found a con census in the heterodox space. I mean, most people have, but never mind that. It's boring. Um, I was reading this PDF where Rollo May, who's a psychologist, psychiatrist back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, a classic kind of guy, somebody worth knowing. Uh, he gave a speech, a talk in uh, Ohio, uh, 1958, the year I was born. And it just struck me how we're still dealing with similar issues now, 
uh, alienation, uh, public health, mental health, uh, how to be a creative person, an authentic person, a self-actualized person, a motivated person, all this kind of stuff. And he addresses it in an interesting way, of course, in a 1950s style way. So trigger warning, uh, if it's not politically correct, exactly the way it we are now, I guess. I don't know much about it, but anyway, it's interesting. So I'm going to read a little bit about that, put some pictures up, and uh, do that for a few videos in the next week. I did a, an hour and a half version of it, but I was having a hard time finding all the imagery and photos and videos that go with everything. <laughs> so I kind of gave up. And it seemed kind of long. I, I more or less read the whole thing. And that might just be a bit tedious for some people. So I'm just going to read some highlights, too, and I hope you find value in it. Again, it's, uh, you know, these, these deep questions that we struggle with as people, as a society, as, as people who are part of a culture, they don't disappear. They don't go away. Uh, I suppose over time there have been paradigm shifts in culture that have occurred, but uh, I think, you know, over the past 70 years or so, we're dealing with kind of similar stuff, only the tools have changed. The algorithms, the artificial intelligence, robotics, metaverse, social media, smartphones. So uh, manufacturing consent and all these things about how to motivate people to do things, nudging people into stuff. It's more sophisticated, it's more efficient, it's more me mechanized than ever. And he kind of talks against this mechanization of people and how to live a more creative, authentic life. I think it's interesting. So I'm going to do that. And uh, Happy New Year. Uh, have a good one. Enjoy your family and friends. Uh, comment. Tell me what you're up to in 2023. What are you going to do? And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Please like, subscribe, uh, share the video if you want to. And um, I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. Boolean T. Out until I turn on the next bit. So uh, I've been trying to I make this piece about uh, this article, or I mean PDF, with Rolla May. And... Uh, Rolla May is a psychologist, psychiatrist from back in the day, a classic uh, guy. You can look him up. Anyway, he, there's a PDF where he's giving a talk and it's uh, releasing the self for creative living. This was in 1958, the year I was born. And it strikes me every time I read something like this how um, we're still struggling with the same issues of meaning, alienation, mental health, uh, what it means to be creative, what it means to be free, what it means to be authentic, our authentic self, all that kind of stuff. And of course, new language comes with it every time. So. Um, Everybody has their new uh, PowerPoint deck and their new lingo and uh, expressions and memes and uh, rhetorical flourishes and uh, all that. And uh, when you read this, you know, it's, it's, it's not in very fashionable language. He's talking about mankind all the time. But the deeper elements of it are common to us now. So I tried to make a piece on this. It wound up being an hour and a half. <laughs> I couldn't find enough uh, visual material to fill it all in. So I was thinking maybe I should just do, a, you know, an audio version. Then I thought, well, this time I'll just try to read you some highlights and see what you think. So he's ta he's in Columbus, Ohio, and. Uh, He's uh, saying that the mechanization of the human personality is ubiquitous. 
It's not just in the big cities like uh, New York City, where advertising and, and propaganda and public relations and all these, uh, you know, modern tools of manufacturing consent and, and uh, getting people to do what you want to do, motivational stuff, uh, is said to have occurred. Obviously, these ideas are global and they build off of many people thinking about things. But um, he's just talking about the organization man, you know, how, and this uh, town called The Future Care of Park Forest. It was an essay written. And some guy, White, was talking about Park Forest, which is a community in Illinois where Everybody lives in kind of suburban housing that look more or less alike, where you can see your neighbors, and it's kind of impolite not to be seen by your neighbors. And since this was a talk given in the 50s, back then we were at the height of this kind of conformity, cultural conformity across the United States. And it was a big deal to fit in, to conform. We still have conformity today. We just, uh, you know, brand it in many different little silos and bubbles. And we all conform to our thing, even if we don't think we're conforming to our thing, we're conforming. But it's not like a, a total national cultural identity thing. We, identity politics is kind of breaking things up. So he talks about it, and people, you know, would rather talk about uh, superficial things than deep things uh, in this community. And, uh, you know, they find it very nerve-wracking if you're not, you know, really, really fitting in. So he goes into that thing. It's quite interesting. So he says, there are the tendencies toward the control of personality below the conscious level. So he's talking about The Hidden Persuaders, another motivational research book and all that. So how, they're, how it's used for selling and things like that. And he's not contem condemning the tool, but he's just observing that it's very powerful in motivating people to do things. Nowadays, we have uh, these tools on steroids with algorithms and uh, social media and all this kind of thing. We're constantly being bombarded and manipulated and we're uh, cooperating with this manipulation. Uh, we find it convenient, we get value from it, so we go along with it, and we get free services like Google and so on. So uh, he's talking about that book was published in, in, uh, in New York, but uh, you know, it's a global thing, and it's seeped into all elements of culture, religious life, art, so he then relates this story that I find interesting, so I'll read it to you. There is a story told of a psychoanalyst in New York City who had decided that he was spending too much time listening to people's pre-associations on the couch, and so he consulted an efficiency expert. We all do that, right? This efficiency expert told him, Yes, it's uh, very clear you spend too much time simply sitting there. What you should do is to get a tape recorder. You can set the tape recorder going and go about more pressing business during the day. And in the evening or later, uh, if you want to, uh, you can listen to the pre-associations of your patients. So the analyst tried the system and, uh, sorry, this skips around when I move my mouse. He tried the system for a week and it worked well, but at 10 o'clock one morning he was down at the corner drugstore having a cup of coffee and who should walk in but the patient for that particular hour. The analyst raised his eyebrows and the patient said, oh, there's nothing to be anxious about. I decided I was spending too much time lying on the couch giving my pre-association, so I consulted an efficiency expert. This efficiency expert said, yes, you're entirely right. You spend too much time doing that. 
What you should do is get a tape recorder and then you can record yourself while you are shaving in the morning or at any odd time during the day. And so the patient said to the analyst, up in your office now, my tape recorder is talking to your tape recorder. So yeah, have we changed, you know? How many tools are we using now to talk to everything, to, to be efficient? <laughs> I just find that amusing. So it goes on about that for a bit. And uh, let's see what's next. Uh, now we get into some stuff. So he's uh, talking about man's search for himself and T.S. Eliot in the wasteland more accurately sensed what our greatest danger is, not the world ending with a bang, but as the poem says, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. So he's talking about the creative self standing against the mechanization of human beings. And now we're going into meta and artificial intelligence, robotics, smartphones, uh, all this kind of stuff. And it just seems like we're getting more mechanized. And is it causing a public health problem at all or some problems? Who knows? But they're talking about it in 58, in the 50s, and now we're talking about it now in different ways, I guess is what I want to say. So he's kind of wants us to be mindful of that and to oppose it on a certain level. So he says, by the creative self, therefore, I do not mean do-it-yourself movements. These are all too good. Nobody has any objection to them. But if living creative involves our only doing what somebody else could do better in a shorter time and cheaper, then somehow it does not seem as though we have hit the most profound level of human existence. The idea that creativity is something you do only on Sunday is to my mind the greatest disparagement of the idea of creative man. We must be talking about something much deeper than that. I mean by the creative self, the capacity of the person to be aware of what is happening to him and by this awareness to take some responsibility in molding himself and molding the world with which he comes into contact and thereby to make himself and of this world which he loves and works with something that is closer to the genuine potentiality within himself and the potentiality within his world. So I think that's really awesome uh, thing to point out. And I'm just going to leave it there for this video so it doesn't go too long. And I'll share some more th insights from this uh, PDF with you in the next video. Uh, yeah. Do what you got to do. Enjoy uh, New Year's Day with your friends and family and have a wonderful January. And let's just, you know, tough it out in 2023. Make it as good as we can. Uh, do what we can, what we need to do. Try to be creative. I'll get back into this creative self in the next video. Uh, click like, subscribe, tell your friends, share this video. And uh, hopefully next year I can spend more time and money getting original content to make uh, better videos or, you know, more interesting content. All the best. Thanks a lot for watching. I appreciate you. Bouillam T. Out.